just to get an ass over the truck and then come on back home. That was the whole thing.
I am the resurrection and the life, says the Lord. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. We brought nothing into the world and we take nothing out. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. And just about say good afternoon and welcome to this very special service to say our goodbyes to Colin, to celebrate his life and to hand him into God's merciful, loving and welcoming arms. Hopefully you can all see a copy of a service order. If you can't, if you just put your hand up and somebody will bring you one. Very special welcome to everybody, but an even more special welcome to Alan in Australia and to all those who are listening on the live stream. It's a shame that due to our present conditions that we can't have the probably hundreds of people who would have wanted to be here today, but it is a wonderful tribute to Colin that we are here together. A couple of notices you'll see on the back of your service order. There will be a retiring collection for the charities named on the service order and the offerings can also be given to the funeral directors. The family would like you to join them if you are able at the Rose at Willoughby following this service to celebrate Colin's life and to have some light refreshments. <clears throat> and sadly, in, under our present conditions, we are unable to sing, but I'm um, told that we can hum. So you can hum as loudly as you like behind your face coverings. I'm sure Colin would have appreciated that. And the hymns of the, and the service have been chosen to reflect Colin and all he brought to so many people. One opening prayer. <clears throat> we have come here today to remember before God our brother Colin, to give thanks for his life, to commend him to God, our merciful Redeemer and Judge, to commit his body to be cremated, and to comfort one another in our grief. God of all consolation, your Son Jesus Christ was moved to tears at the grave of Lazarus, his friend. Look with compassion on your children in their loss. Give to troubled hearts the light of hope and strengthen in each one of us the gift of faith in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The uh, first hymn that we're going to sit and look at the words and hum to, if we wish, is that wonderful hymn, all things bright and beautiful which reflects so much our love of our rural areas and our countryside and where Colin and Barbara have been so happy for so many years. So we listen to all things bright and beautiful.
We've got some family tributes now about Colin. I'm going to read the first one and then Nigel's going to come and give his tribute as well. The first tribute are some words by Barbara, which she has asked me to read for her. And this is what she's written. We were married in 1958 and our marriage lasted 62 years with very few crosswords and certainly no dull moments. At that time, a man's status was of great importance, with wives expected to support rather than question. Not easy for some of us. Colin spent long hours running the family business, but still managed to fit in games of hockey at the weekend. He was a keen player, and for four years was captain of the firsts at Rugby Hockey Club. Later he became president and kept this post for 29 years. Our home life was busy too. Near the end of the first year, we produced our first son, Robert. This was followed by four others before he was eight. Why I mention this is because in all this time, Colin only missed one hockey match. He was assiduous at Whitaker Brothers too, and as public tastes for drinking wine increased, he joined four other separate businessmen in setting up a national wine buying group. This entailed buying directly from wine producers abroad, which meant they could choose the exact quality they wished and at a favourable price, which would then be passed on to the consumer. Other firms joined the group, and soon whole shiploads were being dispatched, very successful, but later the supermarkets followed suit. In 1966, Colin was elected as a Tory councillor for the Caldicott Ward. This was part of Rugby Council. Attendance at the meetings was expected, and this was all on a voluntary basis. Colin stayed until 1971, when the rules changed and councillors were paid a special rate for their attendance. Colin did not think this was a good idea, so he left. However, no matter where he was or what he did, he was always very popular socially. At most functions we went to, it usually followed a pattern. We arrived together, then soon split up, and moved separately all evening. At the end, we collected our coats and went home together. On one occasion, someone standing near me was closely watching Colin as he circulated. I noticed the pleasure several ladies showed when they were talking to him. Now this person was a keen polo player in her time and was well known in the equine world. She turned and asked me, do you always let him have his head like that? Oh yes, I replied, but I never let go of the reins. It seemed to work for us. Life has strange quirks. Today, although it wasn't planned, would have been our eldest son's birthday. To our great sorrow, he died of cancer at the age of 47. His funeral was here too, so we can hold him in our thoughts, as well as our fourth son, Alan, who is on a link from Australia due to the COVID restrictions. Just for a moment, we are together as a family. Barbara finishes with this. We pray for God's blessing on everyone here today and sincerely thank you for coming to say farewell to Colin, who was, as so many of you have said, always a true gentleman. Nigel now will come and speak.
Thank you for coming here today. Dad was born on the 29th of July 1934 in a nursing home at the bottom of Corporation Street in Rugby. He was initially schooled in Rugby, but during the war he went to a school in Milverton in Somerset. Despite the wartime privations, I understand that Dad thoroughly enjoyed his time in Somerset. And in fact, some American soldiers who were waiting to go onto the D-Day landings were at one point stationed near to the school. And Dad and his friends were regularly given rides in jeeps around the sand dunes. And of course, they loved that. On returning to rugby after the war, Dad went to Longrood School and from there to Bloxham School, where he became captain of the rugby team and was awarded school colours in hockey and athletics. On leaving school, he went into the army for national service and he joined the Royal Artillery at Oswestry. During his time there, he was interviewed by his commanding officer and was asked what he would like to do in the army. I understand that Dad apparently replied, well, I wouldn't mind Germany first and then Egypt and perhaps finish off somewhere in Asia. The CO, somewhat taken aback, rather gruffly responded that the army was not offering Dad a world cruise. The CO did, however, recommend Dad for officer training and he went to Sandhurst to meet with the War Office Selection Board, but was then told that they had sufficient recruits at that time and therefore Dad was instead posted to Plymouth. Initially, he was at the heavy ACAC regiment there, where, somewhat to his surprise, on his very first day, he was told that he'd been appointed as battery typist, despite having no typing skills. Talk about a cushy number. However, and after a few months, his CO came to see him and said that he'd been skiving long enough and that he was instead required to take over as head of the motor transport division. Dad had to go on a course attended by, for this, attended by top brass, such as colonels and majors, but he passed with flying colours, and as a result, Dad was promoted to Lance Bombardier. It was on an evening out in Plymouth with some of his friends from the motor transport section that they noticed some young women going into St Andrew's Church, and they decided to investigate. This chance meeting led to Dad and his friends regularly playing tennis at the, at the church social club, and it was here a little while later that he subsequently met with Mum, who had returned to Plymouth from London. And the rest, as they say, is history. Mum and Dad fell in love and married in St Andrew's Church in Plymouth on the 14th of June, 1958. Eight years later, they were the proud but exhausted parents of five boys. Dad went into the family business after the army and was later joined in this by John and Alan. As you will all know, Dad was passionate about hockey, and Mum has mentioned this. Having played both at school and then for the army, he joined Rugby Hockey Club and he played regularly for them, captaining the first team for a number of years. And he also played on occasions for the county. In a club magazine that I found from 1969, it was written, like, it was written that his rock-like defence and sure feet are widely known throughout the Midlands. Dad's hockey skills have clearly skipped a generation and have now passed to Alice, who has become an absolute super little player. Dad was president of the Rugby Hockey Club, as Mum has mentioned, for 29 years. And during this time, he oversaw its growth and its relocation to a new ground. He helped organise an annual hockey festival, embracing teams from home and abroad. And these were a huge success. His love for hockey was something that never left him. And he was even umpiring for the club well into his late 60s. We are deli delighted that several former club members are with us today. And so, what were Dad's key qualities? Kindness. Kindness, tolerance, generousness of spirit, a man of good humour, and a gentleman. All of these qualities have been reflected in the many tributes um, that Mum has received. So, looking at these and other qualities, what can I say on behalf of myself and my brothers? First one, tolerance. I think it's fair to say that Dad had a somewhat laissez-faire and relaxed approach to parenting. And as children and youths, we were largely allowed to run wild. Very few constraints were placed upon us. And it was testament to the relaxed and homely upbringing that we enjoyed that our friends would greatly prefer to come to Ashland Cottage to play rather than be at their own houses. When we became teenagers, we brought an endless stream of mopeds, motorcycles and cars to and from our home. And Robert, 
would frequently take it upon himself to rebuild these, whether or not they needed rebuilding. And as a result, motorbike engines, frames, and other detritus would litter the garage and garden, and yet Dad rarely, if ever, complained. When I had migrated myself from, cars, from motorbikes to cars, I bought an Opel Manta, and it went, went wrong periodically. I thought it would be a great idea to buy a second car to use as spares. Dad was completely unfussed when we put the spare car, pushed it to the back of the garden, and left it there, where over the years it became covered in brambles and never moved. This level of tolerance also extended to the fact that aside from the numerous things mechanical that littered the, the home, Dad also tolerated the multitudinous animals that kept appearing throughout the years. Most people these days have perhaps one dog or one cat, but we, however, at various times, had dogs, cats, horses, rabbits, chickens, ferrets, and even guinea fowl. And of course, along to go with the horses, mounds of clobber, such as saddles, bridles, and driving harnesses, cluttering up the place, as, long as, dri as well as driving carts and carriages. Whilst Dad did express some degree of displeasure when Mum and the rest of uh, my brothers and I turned up one day with a new pony in the transit minibus, Mum having bought it on a whim at a horse fair, he was generally uncomplaining throughout. Health and safety. Dad had a healthy disregard for health and safety and any requirement to follow the rules. There are numerous examples of this, but three of them spring to mind. The first was when the town's football club went bankrupt and Dad bought some fencing from the receivers and we had to go and dismantle it. And while we were there, Dad decided that it would be perfectly okay for us to drive the transit minibus around the football pitch, despite never having driven previously. The climax of the afternoon was when John cornered too tightly and at speed and managed to get the minibus up on two wheels. Dad's reaction was just to laugh and to let us carry on. Another example was in our first house in Barby Road. There was a small paddock. But at that time, we had no animals grazing on it, and so the grass would simply grow uncontrolled. Dad took it into his head that the best way to deal with this towards the end of the summer would be to burn the grass using a technique known as swaling. What Dad hadn't perhaps fully appreciated is that swaling was usually undertaken when burning low stalks of wheat and not for grassy paddocks. The net result was that we boys were absolutely thrilled to see the whole paddock go up like a Roman candle, as well as the adjoining hedgerow and Dad's sports jacket that he left by the paddock. Given that our house was located opposite Rugby Hospital, this was seen as a potential major crisis, and we had teams of fire engines attending to put out the enormous blaze, and Dad looked rather po-faced about all of this. Thankless to say, the exercise in swaling was never repeated. And another sort of example, and on one other memorable occasion, Dad came home one day with an inflatable boat and an outboard motor that he'd bought from a friend of his. We boys were all desperate to try the boat out. But of course, in rugby, the opportunities to do so were considerably limited, it, it being neither by the sea nor having a navigable river. But Dad's highly creative solution was for the first launch to be on the local canal. And so we all piled down there and launched the boat. And 10 minutes later, we boys were to be found in what must have resembled a scene from a James Bond film, bombing up and down the canal and under canal bridges at about 30 miles an hour completely ignoring the five mile an hour speed limit and the somewhat aggrieved anglers, while Dad looked on admiringly from the canal bank. In fact, Dad was always kind enough to indulge our love for boats, and he ensured that wherever possible we had access to a boat when we went on holiday to Devon. And this was something that we absolutely loved. We can all fondly recall rushing down to Len Carter's boat hire in Newton Ferrers and clambering into clinker-built boats with seagull outboards and the lovely pop, 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 pop sound that they made. We would venture out fishing, and um, usually with Dad amidships, Grandpa Penny in the bow, resplendent in his lucky fishing hat, and each of the brothers desperate to take over the steering of the boat. And these were happy, fun-filled days, and they will always remain with us. Creativity. Some of you may not know, but one other notable quality of Dad's was his skill with baler twine. There seemed to be absolutely nothing that Dad couldn't fix with baler twine, whether it be sheds, gates, garden furniture, they were all, in turn, held together with lashings of orange baler twine, and a good supply of the stuff was always kept on hand in case of any repair emergency that might arise. And finally, dancing. Dad's style of dancing was very much based on the shoulder actions of Prime Minister Edward Heath, 
Now, there'll be a number of you here who will be far too, far too young to remember Edward Heath, but he had a way of laughing that resulted in his shoulders bouncing up and down. And Dad, this style was adopted by Dad when dancing. And whenever opportunity arose, he would take to the dance floor with Mum. He'd say, come along, Barbara, and launch into his dancing routine with his shoulders going up and down like this, often accompanied by a bom de bom bom de bom And it was truly unforgettable by anybody who'd witnessed it. As you know, Mum unfortunately suffered a bad riding accident in 1982. And as a result, Dad took early retirement to look after her. Happily, Mum recovered, and both Mum and Dad enjoyed many contented years of good health with a shared love of the countryside and various trips to France and other places on holiday. <coughs> However, when Dad was in his early 70s, he broke his hip in a fall and unfortunately never recovered his full health. In fact, his health subsequently went into steady decline, and the last three years in particular were especially difficult for Mum and Dad, with some sort of crisis happening every month or so. Dad needing further treatment or falling over and hurting himself. And these things took their toll. At this point, I would like to particularly thank John and Philip. For, for providing help and assistance. And I know how much Dad appreciated that. Despite the difficulties in recent years, I never heard Dad complain. I don't know. Here we go. I never heard him complain. I'm sure he'd be the first to acknowledge that he led a fulfilling and enjoyable life. And so, we find ourselves here today saying goodbye. On behalf of myself and my brothers, uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you. Please, okay. Very good, Jim. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for having been a great dad. You're a kind man, a good man. And a true gentleman, we love you. Well done. That's an incredibly difficult thing to do. Thank you. And that leads us wonderfully into reflecting on our next hymn, which is Love Divine. Colin brought so much love to so many people in so many different ways, but in particular to Barbara and his sons and his grandchildren and everybody who knew him. So we're going to reflect on the words of Love Divine as we listen to the music.
Bible reading that's been chosen for Colin today is one that I think will be very familiar to a lot of people, the parable of the Good Samaritan. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up and to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So to a Levite, and when he came to the place and saw him, he too passed on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was, and when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert in the law replied, the one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, go and do likewise. Quite a lot in this reading that we can think about in reference to Colin. Although Colin wasn't a priest or a Levite or a Samaritan, Colin would never have passed by on the other side. Colin would always do anything he could to help anybody. Colin would also always have gone the extra mile, not just help when it was needed, but like the Good Samaritan, he would help over and above what was needed. I've known Colin ever since I've lived in this village when they moved here over 30 years. Him and Barbara have been good friends for uh, many years. I've always found him, as everybody has, charming. He helped so many people, especially young people. He and Barbara were always wonderful hosts. Many, many New Year's Eve dinner parties, which were always very special. He cared about people. He was always interested in their lives. He wasn't at all self-centered. He was always more interested in you than in himself. I never heard him complain either. He seemed to come back from his various illnesses and falls, perhaps physically a little weaker, but with his mind and his humor undeterred. One time, a few years ago, when he was in Wallsgrave after a, a hip operation, I called in to see him and I'd put my collar on and he delighted in telling me that all the other patients in the ward thought he was very, very religious because unknown to me, our local vicar here at the time had also been to see him on the same day. <laughs> Two vicars in one day, he said laughing. We'll all miss Colin's laugh. And I know that Barbara and the family would want me to say thank you to the carers those wonderful people who helped him stay at home where he wanted to be for such a long time. And I know how much they, they loved him 
and how much they cared for him as well. He was popular with so many people. Think of the number of people whose lives he's touched through hockey, wine, his council work over the years. Every one of us is a better person for knowing Colin. Colin was a people person in the same way as the Good Samaritan. We all have our special memories of Colin and that's why we're here today. He'll be missed by so many people in so many different ways. But just like the Good Samaritan, Colin's legacy and memories will live on in the many lives he has touched. So Colin, now rest in peace, in God's living arms, away from your earthly body, which you now don't need. Amen. Going to have some poems read now. A poem chosen by Alan, which John is going to read. When I am gone, release me, let me go. I have so many things to see and do. You mustn't tie yourself to me with too many tears, but be thankful we had so many good years. I gave you my love, and you could only guess how much you've given me in happiness. I thank you for the love that you have shown, but now it is time I travel on alone. So grieve for me a while, if grieve you must, then let your grief be comforted by trust. It is only for a while that we must part, so treasure the memories within your heart. I won't be far away, and life goes on. And if you need me, call, and I will come. Though you can't see or touch me, I will be near. And if you listen with your heart, you'll hear all my love around you, soft and clear. And then, when you must come this way alone, I'll greet you with my smile and welcome you home. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. And there's a poem chosen by Philip, which he will read now. Don't cry for me, now I have died, for I am still here, I'm by your side. My body's gone, but my soul is here, please don't shed another tear. I am still, I'm all around, only my body lies in the ground. I am the snowflake that kisses your nose, I am the frost that nips at your toes. I am the sun bringing you light, I am the star shining so bright. I am the rain refreshing the earth, I am the laughter, I am the mirth. I am the birth bird up in the sky, I am the cloud that's drifting by. I am the thoughts inside your head, while I'm still there, I can't be dead. I'm going to say and read some prayers for us all now but I want you to keep special thought of Colin in your mind his laugh that lovely smile he had raising a glass hitting a hockey ball just being with his family being on in his boat or anything that comes to your mind I've always remembered him telling me on a few occasions about, uh, I think, one or two days when Barbara was away and the carers came to live in. And he told me in great detail about his pork pie being cut up exactly as he wanted it. <laughs> so have that special memory. And at the end of the prayers that I'll read, I'm going to ask you all to join in in the words of the family prayer, which you'll find on your service order. So let us pray. God of mercy, Lord of life, you have made us in your image to reflect your truth and light. 
We give you thanks for Colin, for the grace and mercy he received from you, for all the many good things in his life, for those special memories we treasure today. Especially we thank you for the love that he brought to Barbara, to Robert, Nigel, John, Alan, Philip, all of his family and his many, many friends. We thank you for the care that he received during his illnesses. God, our Father, we thank you that you have made each one of us in your own image and given us gifts and talents with which to serve you. We thank you for Colin and all the many gifts and talents he shared with us. We thank you for his love of life, for his sense of humour, for his gift of caring. We thank you for the time that we have been able to share with him. Now we ask you to give us the strength and the courage to leave him in your care, confident in the promise of eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So we say together the words of the family prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our final hymn gives us some hope, some hope for the future, and some thoughts about Colin. Lord of all gentleness, the final verse, Lord of all calm. Colin was a gentle, and as I knew him, a calm person, and God was there at his departing. So we reflect on the words of Lord of all hopefulness.
to the mercy of God, our Maker and our Redeemer. Colin, go forth from this world in the love of God the Father who created you, in the mercy of Jesus Christ who redeemed you. May the heavenly host sustain you and the company of heaven enfold you and in communion with all the faithful may you dwell from this day in peace. I'm going to also use some of the words of the committal as Colin will go to a private committal at Rainsbrook on a later date. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy, slow to anger and of great goodness. As a father is tender towards his children, so is the Lord tender to those that fear him, for he remembers of what we are made. Our days are like the grass. We flourish like a flower of the field. When the wind goes over it, it is gone and its place will know it no more. But the merciful goodness of the Lord endures for ever and ever towards those that fear him and his righteousness on our children's children. We have entrusted our brother Colin to God's mercy. His body will later be committed for cremation, earth to earth, Ashes to ashes, dust to dust, in sure and certain hope of the resurrection to eternal life. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our frail bodies, that they may be conformed to his glorious body, who died, was buried, and rose again for us. To him be glory forever. Amen. Amen. I'm going to say a blessing now for us all, but just to remind you, uh, there is a retiring collection should you wish to give in that way, and the family would like to see you, if possible, at the Rose at Willoughby. Uh, when I've given a blessing, we're going to listen as we leave to a favourite piece of music of Collins. The God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, make you perfect in every good work to do his will. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be on each one of you and all who lived, Colin, and those in Australia and those listening elsewhere, be among you and remain with each one of you this day and always. Amen. Amen.
thrown down where they were speaking. Right. They pushed it down like that and then spoke over it. Right, okay, yeah, it wasn't quite the normal. Yeah. And he was so good with us. What was I saying? He didn't tell you what, but he might advise you. Yeah, well, but, then, you know, but he basically yeah. let me get on with it. Yeah, he was still with us. And then 18 to 20 years. Yeah, yeah. 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 I've been reading this for 20 years now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 20 years to yeah. yeah. I actually went to start. Well, that's it. I'm Australian. I mean, that's the thing. I always go, I do the job. So we've been to church. Thank you, John. <laughs> 
okay. <laughs> Philip, obviously. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, that was, uh, I believe it was all going off really well. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. Okay, lovely. All right, well, thank you very okay. much for all your help. That's all. Um,